Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our course Physical Chemistry 101. My name is Dr. Lauf. Our topic for today is how to express energy exchange in numbers. Today is about the process variables heat and work. Heat and work are not properties of the system. You can't say there's an amount of heat or an amount of work in a system. Heat and work are always associated with state changes, processes that describe energy transfer between a system and its surroundings, or between a system 1 and a system 2. The so-called sign convention in thermodynamics denotes unambiguously the sign of energy transfer. If a system receives work from the surroundings, if the surroundings does work on the system, then this work is considered to be positive. W has a positive sign. Similarly, we describe heat that enters the system from the outside as a positive quantity. It's like looking at all processes of energy exchange from the perspective of the system. Heat absorption is positive. The system gains energy. Processes with positive amount of heat can be referred to as endothermic. Conversely, if a process is associated to the output of work or heat, if the system expands against an external pressure, or if it loses heat to the surroundings, we are dealing with negative signs of W and Q. If Q is less than zero, the process is referred to as an exothermic one. This sign convention correlates with the requirement that the changes of state variables, the delta Zs, must always be calculated as a difference between final state values minus initial state values. Here's an example. Let's consider a gas. We add some heat. The pressure should be held constant. The system expands and performs work against an external pressure. So initial state and final state are clearly defined. Work has been done by the system. So the sign convention calls for W to be negative. Heat has been absorbed by the system. Q is positive. The process is an endothermic one, and work has been done. We can plot this process in the PVT diagram. It corresponds to an isobar between the states I and F. By the way, each point in our phase diagram corresponds to a state. Each line in the phase diagram, like this green isobar, corresponds to a process, a change of states. We will now discuss another endothermic process, the heat absorption of water, starting with solid ice at 0 degrees Celsius. In particular, we want to track the temperature of the system. On the abscissa, we plot the variable temperature in kelvins, 273 kelvins correspond to 0 degrees Celsius. On the coordinate, we plot the absorbed heat, or more precisely, the specific heat in joules per gram. We start at 273 kelvin and 1 gram of solid ice. If we add heat, the temperature will initially not change. The ice absorbs heat and melts at constant temperature. After having absorbed 333 joules of heat, the ice has completely melted to liquid water of 273 Kelvin. If we continue to add heat, the temperature of our system increases. The increase in temperature correlates very well with the amount of heat absorbed. To reach 373 kelvins, that is 100 degrees Celsius, we need a further 418 joules of heat. 
at 373 kelvins, further heat absorption does not result in a temperature increase, but again in a phase change. The water evaporates. 200, sorry, 2,257 joules are required to vaporize one gram of water to one gram of steam. Additional heat then increases the temperature of the steam above 373 kelvins. This plot is a thermal fingerprint of the pure substance water. Such diagrams are measured and interpreted in thermal analysis. We want to discuss this diagram. At 273 and uh, 373 Kelvin, heat does not cause a change in temperature. This is what we call latent heat. In detail, we've measured two amounts of latent heat. The specific heat of fusion of 333 joules per gram and the specific heat of vaporization of 2,257 joules per gram. Sensitive heat, on the other hand, is always associated with temperature change. The heat required for a certain temperature change, or more precisely formulated, the slope of this graph is called heat capacity capital C. If based on one gram of substance, we speak of the specific heat capacity, C sub P. C sub P is almost constant for water between 273 and 373 Kelvins. It takes 418 joules for the temperature of water to increase by 100 Kelvin. That is, C is 4.18 joules per gram and Kelvin. As the slope of this curve is the heat capacity, conversely, heat may be calculated by integrating heat capacity C times dt. In this way, sensitive heat is often calculated from temperature changes. If I know the initial temperature, the final temperature, I simply have to integrate. By differentiating the just seen QT diagram, we get a plot of heat capacity as a function of temperature. This plot is extended to negative Celsius temperatures. Solid water has a specific heat capacity of about 2 joules per gram and Kelvin. As expected, there is a singularity at 273 Kelvin. With latent heat, the heat capacity goes to infinity. Between 273 and 373 Kelvin, the graph shows the constant heat capacity of liquid water, 4.18 joules per gram and Kelvin. Then a singularity at 373 Kelvin, and above 373 Kelvin, the specific heat capacity of water vapor of 1.8. 8, 8 joules per Kelvin and gram. This chart was created by differentiating the previous heat temperature diagram. Conversely, I may calculate amounts of heat by integrating this chart. The relationship between temperature difference and sensitive heat leads to the fundamental equation of calorimetry. Calorimetry is a science of making heat measurements. If a system A at initial high temperature and system B at initial low temperature are connected by a heat conducting medium, thermal equilibrium can be established. Heat flows from A to B and results in the same final temperature in both systems. The change in temperature, delta T for system A, is negative. The process for system A has been exothermic. For system B, the process was endothermic. 
The temperature changes delta T sub A and delta T sub B will generally not be equal. However, what is equal is the amount of exchanged heat. The heat Q sub A given off by A is equal to the negative of the heat Q sub B absorbed by B. If you calculate the heat from the temperature differences using heat capacity, you end up with this relationship, the fundamental equation of calorimetry. From temperature measurements, we can calculate amounts of heat or determine heat capacities. The basic equation in this form is a simplification since it's assumed that heat capacity is constant. Here are a few numbers. We are already familiar with the specific heat capacity of liquid water 4.18 joules per Kelvin and grams or 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram and Kelvin. Easier to remember using a non-official unit of heat, one large calorie per kilogram and Kelvin. If you prefer moles to kilograms, you'll be interested in the molar heat capacity, capital C sub Pm. Converting specific to molar quantities, you merely have to multiply by the molar kilo weight. 4.18 times 18 ends up with 75.29 joules per Kelvin and mole. The heat capacity of liquid water is more than twice as large as the heat capacity of solid or gaseous water. In fact, the specific heat capacities of many substances are significantly smaller than the value for water. Work and heat are path dependent. Therefore, for these process variables, the path has always to be specified. The subscripts P and V denote an isobaric path or an isochoric path, respectively. We want one gram of air, that is 855.8 milliliters, to warm up by one Kelvin. The amount of heat required depends on whether the process is carried out in an isochoric or an isobaric way. With isochoric heating, the volume is being held constant. Imagine a closed tin can on a hot plate. To increase temperature by 1 Kelvin, 0 0.7 joules of heat have to be isochorically added. Carrying out the temperature rise isobarically, the walls of the system have to be movable Imagine an open tin can on a hot plate. When heated, the volume will increase slightly. A temperature increase of 1 degree now requires 1.0 joule of heat, an isobaric heat. Obviously, the isobaric heat is larger than the isochoric heat. So, isochoric and isobaric heat capacities are different too. Accordingly, the heat capacities carry the subscripts P and V2. The difference between C sub P and C sub V is particularly large for gases. In addition, the heat capacities of gases show a number of interesting phenomena. For gases, the ratio C sub P over C sub V, the so-called adiabatic coefficient kappa, is related to the molecular structure. Having single atom gases like argon, helium or mercury vapor, kappa turns out to be 1.6. Diatomic gases show a kappa value of 1.4. Another remarkable feature of the heat capacities of gases, the difference between the isobaric molar heat capacity and the isochoric molar heat capacity has always a value of about 8.3 joule per mole in Kelvin. And this is the ideal gas constant. We've talked a lot about the process variable heat. Now a few statements on work. Work is force times
times displacement, as you might remember. Accurately told, work is a scalar product of force and distance. Gravitational work is m times g times h. The stretching of a spring is slightly more complicated because the force is not constant. The elastic work is one half d s squared. In electrical engineering, we move charges through an electric field. With an ammeter, we measure the current. With a voltmeter, we measure the strength of the electric field or voltage. Electrical work is u times i times t. i times t is the charge. In thermodynamics, pressure volume work or PV work is very important. Any system that expands or compresses with an external pressure present exchanges PV work with the surroundings. If we compress air from 858.7 milliliters to 855.8 milliliters, the surroundings do work on the system. We want to calculate this work. A force has to act along a path. The force that results from the external pressure is P external times the area A of the piston. The path results from the exchange in volume to dV over A. So I get the formula for the PV work to minus P external times dV. The negative sign is mandatory due to the sign convention. A positive value of dV means a negative value of dW. If the external pressure is constant and equal to the internal pressure, PV work is simply W equals minus P delta V. The PV work can be represented in the PV diagram as an integral, an area under the corresponding line from initial to final state. So we end up with 0.29 joules PV work. Today's summary are merely two formulas. Heat can be calculated from temperature difference as dQ equals capital C times dT. And PV work can be calculated from volume change to dW equals minus P sub X. TV. Thanks for watching. See you next time.